Welcome to Canada Park, a short drive from Jerusalem. It appears to be a serene haven in a troubled region. Canadians paid for this park, a popular weekend spot open to both Israelis and Palestinians. But the young men who race their bikes here pass within a few feet of Palestinian graves. Picnic tables sit amid the rubble and reinforced concrete of demolished houses. This is all that remains of Imwas, a Palestinian village now erased from the map. Some people believe this Imwas to be the biblical Imwas, the place where Jesus first met his disciples after the resurrection, an inspiration for the old masters. On the other side of Canada Park, more rubble, more reinforced concrete. The remains of another village, Yalu. Just beyond the hills of the park was Beit Nuba. It too is now gone, and in its place sit the trailers of a new community, an Israeli settlement. The three villages were leveled by the Israeli army. About 10,000 people were driven out. In 1967, Israel feared an assault from neighboring Egypt and launched a preemptive strike. Israel was to win the war within six days. On the first day, Jordan entered the war, and Israel quickly captured land up to the Jordan River, known as the West Bank. Part of that land commanded the road to Jerusalem. It was a thumbprint known as the Latrun Salient, where once stood the villages of Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. Today, it is the site of Canada Park, a park filled with antiquities and recreation areas, according to the official tourist guide. The names of the Canadians who gave $15 million to build the park are displayed at its entrance. Their money was donated to the Jewish National Fund, an agency affiliated with the Israeli government that reforests and procures land for Israel. The JNF's plantings provide a shady respite amid the ruins, but can't conceal what the Israeli army left behind. The destruction of what used to be here was protested by then Israeli parliament uh, member Yuri Avneri. By putting that park there and calling it Canada Park, uh, you give a Canadian cover up to a war crime. Lush groves now cover the hills along what was the main street in the disappeared village of Imwas. It used to look like this. That's my house. We showed these slides to an Imwas village elder now living in Jordan. It was the first time Ibrahim El Sheikh had seen photographs of the demolition. Such destruction. These photographs were taken by an Israeli soldier. Another soldier ordered to take part in the destruction protested by writing a detailed account. He is reluctant to discuss it today, but Amos Keenan stands by his report. I told the truth, and the truth is what I saw. Can you describe it for me now, though? I'd like to hear you. No, it, it is described perfectly in the report, and it's on the spot in true time and it's better than I could describe it now. Here is part of what Amos Keenan wrote. The unit commander told us that it had been decided to blow up three villages in our sector. They were Beit Nuba, Imwas, and Yalu. They were old people who could hardly walk, murmuring old women, mothers carrying babies, small children. The children wept and asked for water. They all carried white flags. On that road, 24 years ago, was Hussein Salima. He remembers his flight from Yalu. My brother and I had got separated from our mother, and we were searching for her. Then someone told us where she was, and because I was young, I started running. And I got very thirsty. So thirsty that I, I thought I was going to die. And I started crying. I need water. Soldier Amos Keenan continues his report. More old people, more women, more babies. They dropped down exhausted where we told them to sit. Some had a cow or two, a calf, all their property on earth. We drove them out. 
They go on wandering in the south like lost cattle. The weak die. Imwas elder Ibrahim El Sheikh remembers some of those who died. Yes, people died on the road. One old man from Beit Nuba was lying under a cedar tree resting, and he died. He was about 70, 80 years old. Muhammad Shahada Mustafa died. He was disabled. And Zab Ahmad Musa also died on the road. This is what's left of Mr. Al Sheikh's house. A door, some rusted steel rods, and rubble. It's the sort of rubble that litters this park, but is not mentioned in the JNF guide. It directs visitors to ancient ruins and ignores that only 24 years ago, these were the homes of Arab families. Prior to our visit to Canada Park, the Jewish National Fund's Toronto office assured us the park was built on only the fields of these villages, not on their remains. But this clearly is the site of Yalu Village. There is evidence everywhere. The sabra plants grown for hedges, the fruits of the gardens, and the skeletons of the homes. Yet despite all of this, the JNF in Israel denies this village is in their park. Benny Mushkin is their director of information. No, Yalu is not in the park, I think. Yes, it is. Yalu is not inside the park, I'm sorry. What is in the park are JNF signs like this one, which point the way toward Yalu. Once you've found Yalu, there are signs to guide you through it, on larger signs marked with both the JNF logo and, in Hebrew, Canada Park. I repeat and say it again, Yalu is not well, in the area of the park. Well, you've got a sign there saying That's, it is, Mr. Mushman. Then it's a mistake. Have you walked around the park and seen the reinforced concrete that represents the homes of these people? I've been to this park a number of times, yes. Have you noticed the rubble from these people's homes? Now that I can remember, but I wouldn't be surprised if I saw some. Will you say, yes or no, that this park sits on two Arab villages? No, all I can tell you is that within the area of the park, there are two Arab villages. For the Canadians who thought they were reforesting Israel, the ruins might come as a surprise. We asked Benny Mushkin if the JNF told them Imwas and Yalu are in the park. Did you tell them? That it's built on two... No, Arab we did not. You didn't? No, we did not. No, because we... No, no, excuse me, because we did not build a park on the two villages. All we did is take the area which was here and, as I say, reconstruct it, enhanced it, and improved it against what we received here when we entered the area. The area is much, much nicer now than it was before. Well, the people who lived here before they were thrown out might not say that. That's their, that's their prerogative, definitely. After the 1967 war, Palestinian refugees scrambled across the Allenby Bridge into Jordan. Among them were thousands of homeless villagers from Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. Their new community was a series of tents pitched in a barren desert. Although many would leave this camp and be assimilated into Jordanian society, there are those who remain. The Talbia refugee camp, once thought temporary, has stood now for 24 years. We toured the camp with Dr. Ismail Zaid, a former resident of Beit Nuba. He was visiting Jordan from Halifax, where he is a professor of pathology at Dalhousie University. He introduced us to his former neighbor, Amina Suleiman. Beit Nuba was taken just one day after her wedding. The bride and groom had left the village for the night and were never allowed to return. All our clothes, everything was at home. Is there anything more precious than your land? It's my homeland, my country. Take my eyes, let me stagger blind in the street, but don't take my homeland. God willing, she says we are willing to go and eat, eat soil in our village rather than <laughs> How painful is it for you to hear this sort of a story? I think it's immeasurable pain. What do you mean, Dr. Sam? To see how my own people are dispossessed completely and driven out in their homes and have to live in shacks here, deprived of their birthright, 
while hundreds of thousands of foreigners, complete aliens from Kiev and Moscow and Toronto, can go and live on my land and their land. It's immeasurably painful, I can't tell you how much. But I, I understand the pain of these people. I grew up with them and I lived with them and I know that they're attached to the land. Dr. Zaid was furious when he discovered that people in his new country, Canada, were collecting money to put a park over villages that neighbored his own, and that those donations were tax deductible. I was mortified when I read in the Chronicle Herald in 1978 that uh, people in Halifax were being honored, and I repeat the word honored, for building Canada Park on the ruins of people's homes in Amoise and vicinity. And I thought, this is appalling. And, yet, and, and there was the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, the Mayor of Halifax, participating in this honoring process. I don't Dr. Zaid carries with him a set of useless keys to a door he will never unlock. My mother, when they walked out of our house, well, quite innocently, she thought that they just came to be told to stay out of the village for a few hours or a few days and, and we'll be returning back. So she brought the keys to our house with her. But of course, the house doesn't exist anymore, but we still hold the keys for what it's worth. These are the remains of Dr. Zaid's house. On land that once belonged to his family, new houses for different families. Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. Abu Majid laments the loss of his land, too. He was born in the village of Imwas. He views the commemorative plaques at the entrance to Canada Park with bitterness. They stand now where his house once stood. When you have lost everything, you of course feel sad. But when you see other people helping your oppressor, that just intensifies the tragedy. He must make his way past afternoon picnickers to pay his respects to dead relatives. His parents lie here in this neglected cemetery where he comes to pray at their headstone and remember the day they lost this village. There was no battle in our village. Not a single shot was fired at the Israeli army. I can confirm that. We were sitting with the Mukhtar at around midnight when a Jordanian officer named Fazi came and told us that they were pulling out and we would have to manage for ourselves. The Israelis entered the village as if they were on parade. This is the Israeli army entering the villages. There is no evidence in these photographs taken by one of the soldiers they met any resistance. The pictures corroborate the testimony of other troops who say a search turned up only one wounded Egyptian commando. The destruction of villages occupied by civilians was a sinister action in the eyes of then Knesset member Yuri Abneri. Civilian population is protected under international law, under the uh, Hague Convention, the Geneva Conventions, and uh, was certainly uh, a, a war crime, no question about it. The eradication of these villages and the, the deportation or the uh, expulsion of the villagers, especially in the very inhuman, inhumane way in which it was done according to what Amos Kanan uh, testified to, uh, th these are crimes under any standard of, of international law. There are three men who might explain why this had to be done. Defense Minister Moshe Dayan died in 1981. General Uzi Narkis was commander of the troops in the region. Yitzhak Rabin was the army chief of staff. Was a Palestinian village now erased from the map. Some people believe this Imwas to be the biblical Imwas, the place where Jesus first met his disciples after the resurrection, an inspiration for the old masters. On the other side of Canada Park, Welcome to Canada Park, a short drive from Jerusalem. It appears to be a serene haven in a troubled region. Canadians paid for this park, a popular weekend spot open to both Israelis and Palestinians. 
But the young men who race their bikes here pass within a few feet of Palestinian graves. Picnic tables sit amid the rubble and reinforced concrete of demolished houses. This is all that remains of Imark, more rubble, more reinforced concrete. The remains of another village, Yalu. Just beyond the hills of the park was Beit Nuba. It too is now gone, and in its place sit the trailers of a new community, an Israeli settlement. The three villages were leveled by the Israeli army. About 10,000 people were driven out. In 1967, Israel feared an assault from neighboring Egypt and launched a preemptive strike. Israel was to win the war within six days.